All right. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Lauren Nessler, and I am an academic specialist, and I work at the system-wide office for UCEAP, and I'll let my co-presenters introduce themselves now. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Ashley Bayman. I use she, her, AIA pronouns, and I'm a global learning program coordinator and advisor at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Hi, everyone. My name is Brandon Yoon. I am a UCSB alumni, and I studied abroad in South Korea during my third year. Hi, everybody. My name is Elizabeth. I am a UCSC alumni and a UCEAP alumni, a three-time UCEAP alumni, and I studied abroad in Brazil, Mexico, and Chile as a first-gen low-income student. All right. Um, so Thank you everyone for joining us. We have our wonderful panelists who are gonna be talking a little bit more about their experiences um, a little bit later in our presentation. Oops. So let's start by highlighting the benefits of studying abroad through the University of California Education Abroad Program or UCEAP, which is the official study abroad program for the entire UC system. Our programs are designed specifically for UC students. With programs in over 40 countries, you will be able to find the perfect study abroad program to suit your needs. While on UCEAP, you remain enrolled at your UC campus, which means you don't need to take a leave of absence during your study abroad and your financial aid can go with you. Additionally, you are guaranteed that all the courses you take abroad will receive UC credits. So what's significant about an iceberg? So when we see an iceberg, the visible part is really just a small part at the top and the, the majority of the iceberg is actually under the surface. It's not visible to the, to the eye. And similarly, people often think of culture as the observable characteristics or the observable things such as food, flags, dress, um, fashion, greeting rituals. But the reality is that these are just an external manifestation of deeply rooted things, values, beliefs, thoughts, attitudes. And um, these come from what, these are from what people learn as things that are good, desirable, right? And also what people believe are bad, wrong, and undesirable. In many cases, different cultures might have a similar core value, such as honesty or respect, but it actually might be manifested in different ways. Um, and ultimately, the internal forces become visible to the outside observer observer in the form of observable behaviors. So in your preparation for your study abroad experience, you may find that you're really kind of only able to do a lot of research on the visible parts of culture, and that's perfectly fine. But once you get on site, you're gonna really want to be an active observer of the culture around you and really dive deep and see what kind of beliefs and values are feeding into those visible parts of your host, host culture. Um, this will also be an opportunity for you to reflect on your own core, core values. Um, you may find that you have a core value in common with your host culture, but it may manifest itself in different ways. This image right here is a social identity wheel, which is encourages you to identify your unique social identities and reflect on the ways those identities may become visible uh, or more strongly felt in different cultural spaces. So the ideas at the center of the wheel, those are the ones that are more salient. They're at the core of who we are. We learn about these identities through our family, our friends, um, our school, or our religious centers. And then um, the ones on the outer wheel are things that not, are not as visibly apparent as those in the center. What's important about this in the context of study abroad is to unpack how your identities may present themselves differently in the US versus in the location where you're studying abroad. Um, and you may not actually know how that adjustment's gonna happen until you are abroad. And that, that's perfectly fine as well. But um, we, what we wanna encourage you to do is think about this wheel, think about this wheel now, um, as that preparation will really help you for the experiences that you do have abroad. At the end of this presentation, we're gonna give you um, a blank wheel that you can download and you can work on. And we encourage you to think about doing that exercise. And I'm gonna turn it over to Ashley. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, so hi, everyone again. Um, so when I was in college, I studied abroad three times, once in Mexico during community college and then in Brazil and Argentina when I got to the university. 
And I can tell you that each of my experiences studying abroad were profoundly different. And many of the challenges I experienced were in direct relation to my identities. For example, when I was in Brazil, I was the only black student in my cohort. So I felt very minoritized in that space. But because Brazil is a mixed heritage nation, I was actually part of the majority for the first time ever in my life. But as an American, I still felt excluded. Um, contrastingly, when I was in Argentina, I felt more minoritized than ever because, because it is a very white nation. And that was at first very difficult to adjust to. Um, I felt that, you know, I always got looks on the train and out in public because black people are so underrepresented there. So I say all this to say that it can be really helpful to think about who you are and what your values are, because oftentimes how you identify may be perceived very differently in another culture. And you may even experience shifts in your identities when you're in different cultural contexts. Um, so looking at my own cultural iceberg, as part of my visible identities, you might be able to tell that I am BIPOC, although it might not be immediately apparent what race or ethnicity is, what, what race or ethnicity I am. Um, you may also see that I am female, able-bodied, and while I am no spring chicken, I also hope I don't look over 50 either, which would place me in the millennial generation off of looks alone, and you'd be right. Um, however, invisibly, you may not be able to tell that I'm actually multiracial, coming from a mixed race household. Unless you know me, you might not infer that I am cisgender, meaning that my gender corresponds with my birth sex. Um, and then some other aspects you might not immediately guess is that I am low income, I was a first generation and transfer college student, and those lived experiences in higher ed led me to be an equity minded practitioner. Next slide. So as I mentioned, um, in different cultural spaces, we may experience a shift in our cultural icebergs and we'll explore that throughout the next two slides. Um, so one shift could be a shift in privilege. You know, when I studied abroad as a low income first generation transfer student of color, I didn't consider myself privileged at all. I worked my butt off with two jobs as a waitress and bartender just to be able to afford to study abroad. And I still had to take out loans that I'm paying for to this day. Um, but what I found is that economic privilege changes drastically in other cultural environments. So while I identified as a low income student, in places like Mexico and Brazil, I would technically be considered middle class because of the average salaries in Latin America um, and also my access to the American dollar, which is a stronger form of currency in Latin America. Um, another privilege that we may not always think about is being able to access higher education, whether it's community college or a university. For example, in some countries, there still exists gender inequality in higher ed. Um, citizenship is something I do usually think about because of my close relationships with undocumented folks, uh, but outside the US, being a US passport holder allows you interest into many different countries without a visa. And you also may find yourself as part of a privileged racial or ethnic background in certain countries. And then obviously the privilege of being able to study abroad and access international education. Next slide, please. So now I wanna share with you how my cultural icebergs changed and even clashed when I studied abroad. Um, I shared what I perceive as some of my most salient or important identities when I am in the US. But what I found was that in different cultural environments, other parts of my identity came to the surface that I don't even think about. For example, in Latin America, it's still obvious that I'm a woman of color, uh, which is why they refer to me as Morena. Uh, but folks in my cultural communities very much saw me as an American and as a foreigner or outsider. Um, while I spoke Spanish and Portuguese, I was still learning at that time. So it was obvious that I'm an English speaker or Anglophone. And again, because of my access to a strong form of currency, I was not seen as someone from a low income background, but rather someone from a middle socioeconomic status because I was studying abroad as part of my college experience. Again, these are parts of my identity that I never think about in the US, but they also kind of defined how others perceive me in Latin America. Um, in terms of my invisible identities, my US values really came to the surface in various ways, starting with my comfort with personal space. Um, if you go to Latin America, you'll find that a lot of times on public transport or while standing in a line, personal space isn't really a thing. I, I guess I have a direct form of communication in the sense that if I have a thought, I'll express it. And in Argentina, for example, my experience with classroom pedagogy was more or less authoritarian 
So like the professor is the holder of knowledge and students are there to learn rather than question. Um, some other US values I noticed more were my timeliness and punctuality. I can tell you that in Brazil, if they say the party is starting at eight, you will be early if you get there at 10. Um, also in the US, I'm used to waiting in line to purchase items, but at the street food stalls in Argentina, if you don't throw them bows, you ain't getting your choripan. Um, so again, really the point of this presentation is to get you all to recognize how your perception of your identity might change in your host culture and to prepare yourself for those transitions. Now, this is nothing negative, um, but it is important to think critically about all parts of your identity and how some parts may come to the surface in unexpected ways during your study abroad program. Next slide, please. So I think I've talked way too much and would now like to introduce our panelists and invite them to share their own stories. So Elizabeth and Brandon, would you both introduce yourselves? Hi, everybody. So my name is Elizabeth Raquel Garcia. Like I mentioned earlier, I was a three-time UCEAP alumni. Again, I studied abroad in Brazil, Mexico, and Chile, and each time was its own unique experience. I participated in the um, at the private university in Brazil and studying abroad in Rio de Janeiro, and I studied Portuguese there. Later, I went and did an anthropological field research program in Mexico, which was amazing. And then I went to Chile and I studied just like the other Chilean students in their, um, in their regular classrooms, um, taking Spanish courses or courses instructed in Spanish. So it was really amazing. And every single opportunity and experience was completely unique, right? Um, so a couple of different um, identities that I hold um, a couple of different identities that I hold really um, were brought out when I went abroad, especially because I am a first gen low income student, but I also decided to study in places uh, that I have relations to. Right. So I studied abroad in Brazil, and though I have no um, direct relation to the country or to the people, I am of Latin American heritage. Then I studied in uh, Mexico and I'm of Mexican descent. I studied in Chile and I'm also of Chilean descent. So I had relations um, in all of these places and everywhere I went, my identity kind of shifted a little bit depending on the type of relationship I have along with um, the different identities I hold in relation to that. Thank you, Elizabeth. Hi everyone, my name is Brandon Yoon. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I studied abroad in South Korea for one year. And I went to Yonsei University in particular because that's actually where my parents met. Uh, and so for me, going to South Korea was this whole journey of personal discovery, you know, hopefully trying to connect my heritage, you know, learn my roots, learn Korean, uh, possibly get married as well, but that didn't happen. Uh, but you know what? Many other things did happen. And I learned a lot about myself through actually uh, learning more about other people. So hoping to kind of talk more about that later today. Uh, so thank you both so much. Um, so now we'd like to allow each of you to take turns answering the following question, which is, what was it like navigating your identity in your host communities? And in what ways did you experience any shifts in your identity while studying abroad? So I'll go ahead and get started. Identity is very complex. And what I learned from my study abroad experiences, like I mentioned a little while ago, is everywhere I go, my identity, the perception of my identity shifts. While my identity stays like stagnant, they're not gonna change. Um, the way people perceive me in different places are very different. So I, I will just um, share a little bit more about my identity. So I'm first gen, I'm low income, I am Latina. I, have, I come from a mixed, um, like a mixed status family. I am also queer and I live with a chronic health condition. So all of these different things, when people look at me, they might not um, perceive me as holding all these identities, especially in the different places I went. So for example, when I studied abroad in Brazil, um, I lived in the most bougie neighborhood in all of Rio, right? And I come from a low income community here in, the, um, in East LA. So I was living in this very, very fancy place in Rio, um, but of course I have light skin, right? So people assumed I was a very wealthy, um, Brazilian well off or wealthy Latin American. A lot of people thought they would cat call me on the streets and they would call me Argentina all the time um, because they thought I was Argentine, although I'm not. So 
really going to Brazil helped me understand, oh, okay, there's a really big shift. People see me as, um, I might see myself as a poor, low income, just a girl from East LA, but when people see me here, they see me as um, a wealthy, well off, a white person living in Brazil, right? Whereas I, my identity or how I identify myself was completely different from that. So that was very, very new to me. And um, so that was my experience in Brazil. I also wanted to mention that while there, I didn't speak Spanish at the time. So I didn't fit in with being, um, personally, I didn't fit in with being Brazilian, right? But I also didn't fit in, while people might've perceived me as being Latin American, I also didn't speak Spanish. So I was like, oh my gosh. Um, but as soon as I opened my mouth, people were like, oh, you're American, right? <laughs> you are very much a gringa. And just a really important note, Brazilians actually call everybody who is not from Brazil gringos, everybody. If you're not Brazilian, if you're from Chile, if you're Mexico, if you're from Bolivia, you're still a gringo because you're not from Brazil. So that was very interesting to me. Um, moving on later, I went to Mexico and um, I went to Mexico with the purpose of reconnecting with my culture, my family, my heritage and my language. Uh, my purpose was language acquisition. So I went to the university first back at UCSC, took all the language courses, and then I went to Mexico. And the goal was to um, learn Spanish. That way I can go to Chile. My identity in Mexico also shifted because um, here I was, I was medio gringa, learning Spanish. It was very bad, um, but I was learning. And when people would look at me, they would say, hmm, um, are you Mexican? Are you American? Where's your family from? And I would tell them, oh, my family is from Jalisco. Um, and they're like, mm hmm. And people from Jalisco, oftentimes they look like me. We have similar features with light skin, dark hair, big brown eyes, right? The tapatio eyes, they say. Um, but oftentimes when I would tell people that I'm also Chilean, they're like, oh, tu eres la chilena. You're Chilean. You're not even Mexican. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is getting much more complex. Um, and so finally, when I went to Chile, I finally learned, I spoke Spanish, it was great, I fit in. Um, I look very Chilean, like if you were to go to Chile and see the people, like I just blend in right away. Um, again, like the people in Jalisco who might even have lighter features than I do. In Chile, pe most people um, oftentimes look like me with the dark hair, the light skin, the brown eyes. Um, so when I went to Chile, I was able to fit in more with the language, people thought that I was Chilean just by seeing me. But again, if I opened my mouth and my accent was a little bit different because I, I mostly speak with a Mexican dialect um, and also like an anglicized dialect, I would say. So it was just very, very complex. Um, so those were navigating all like the racial, ethnic, socioeconomic identities that I hold. And that's not even to mention my experiences as a queer woman as a person with a chronic pain, uh, with a chronic health condition, right? So, I talked about the racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic identities, but also my identity as a queer person kind of shifted in these different places as well, based on um, level of acceptance, level of safety, and kind of my visibility or invisibility. So that was also very unique. I will just share briefly that in Brazil, I completely closeted myself out of fear just out of extreme fear. In Mexico, I had I experienced an immense amount of freedom because of the thriving LGBTQIA plus community there, especially in Mexico City. Um, and I found my community in Oaxaca as well, which is where I did my field research. And then in Chile, when I was really um, on the ground meeting a lot of family for the first time again, the closeting came back in. So those are just some of my experiences with identities. You can see how it shifts in every single place that I went to um, based on my socioeconomic, racial, ethnic background. And then again, how I chose to hide some identities depending on where I went. Wonderful, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, so for me, I'm gonna skip to the end of my story and then kind of backpedal. So for me, like the lesson I learned is that if you are a young person, if you are a college student, uh, it's natural to feel insecure about some parts about yourself, it could be for a number of reasons, or you might even feel like there's something about your identity that you don't quite um, accept yet, or you struggle with. Um, and if you're feeling that way, I think that college is a great opportunity to kind of go out of your comfort zone and meet people and do things that are so different than what you're used to. 
And in doing so, that helps you realize that you are a very unique person and you're not just an association or a part of a group, but you are like are a wholly full, complete individual and that in and of itself is very valuable. So now how I got to that conclusion was through study abroad, in my case. Um, like I mentioned earlier, my parents uh, met at Yonsei. My dad was studying abroad and my mom was working there. Um, so I came from a very international background, right? But growing up in my neighborhood, um, there weren't a whole lot of kids who looked like me, you know? So as a kid, people would say to me like, you know, Brandon, you are a Korean guy. Like, in fact, you're like the only Korean guy that we know. So like, that's your thing. And I kind of just accepted that, you know, I didn't really fight back. I just thought, okay, this is how it is. When I went to college, I met other Korean American students. Um, and they said to me, like, Brandon, you're not Korean enough. You know, you don't speak as well as we do. You don't have the cultural aspects. And that made me feel a little bit confused. Um, so I thought I'd go abroad and kind of figure this out, right? And going to Korea, uh, people heard me speak, obviously, and they said, oh, like, you're an American. Like, how cool is that? Like, you look Korean, but you can speak English perfectly. That's like an incredible quality that you have. And that type of privilege kind of made me feel a sense of pride in a sense initially. Um, but what I realized after a while and after developing more meaningful and deeper friendships is that these things are very surface level associations, right? So you might think of yourself as you are an ethnic minority or an ethnic majority. Um, but what I found was that by actually going outside of a comfort zone and actually making friends from different backgrounds, from not just Korea, but from all over the world, um, studying together in classrooms, sharing meals together, doing activities. I found that there's a very deep sense of human commonalities that it's hard to pick up on if you're just stuck in one place your whole life. You know, by going outside of your zone, you realize that there's much more in common that we have than differences. Um, and in doing so, I found that I'm not just a Korean person. I'm not just an American person. You know, I am the sum of my experiences. Um, I am the son of my parents, uh, the grandson of my grandparents, you know, and I choose to be who I am based upon my actions, my words, how I conduct myself. Um, these are the things that really define who I am. And that realization really empowered me. It helped me step forward and kind of move beyond insecurities and uh, be inspired to actually help others come to the same conclusion as well. Thank you both so much for sharing. I just want to say that I wish we had, I we're almost at 4.30, but I wish we had 20 more minutes. I could listen to you talk all day. I love every, all of your takeaways. Everything that you've shared today is incredible. It's, it's really, really wonderful. Um, I am going to kind of quickly speed through the end of this. Um, we have some resources that we'd like to share with you on the screen. There's um, two resources, Diversity Abroad, um, which is a, um, Sorry, I lost my notes. Um, it's, it's an organization that um, provides a lot of resources for students in the planning stages of their study abroad experience. Um, I also have the UC Santa Cruz Identities, Identities Abroad and Away website here as well. Um, there, this website is wonderful. They have a lot of videos to help you think about the concepts that we've talked about today. They also have more um, in-depth um, pages on on identities, things such as um, first gen students, religious diversity, gender expression, disabilities. And so if you wanna dive deeper into those topics, you can go to their website and click on those pages and get more information. Really, really great page there. Um, we have two exercises that we said that we would provide to you. As I mentioned earlier, we have a link to a social identity wheel. If you wanna go ahead and download that, download it, the blank wheel with some instructions, we encourage you to do that to think about your own so, uh, self-culture and your so, own so, social identity wheel. We also have a link to cr critical incident scenarios. These are um, some scenarios that UC San Diego helped us with. And um, so basically it's a list of possible scenarios that you could come up against while you're abroad. And it encourages you to think about how you would react if one of these things happened to you or if it happened to somebody in front of you. Um, and it's, it's just a really great exercise, again, to start thinking through actual real life scenarios. It can ease your transition into your, into your study abroad experience. And then lastly, this is the best part, student stories. We know student stories are the best. Um, both UC San Diego and UC Berkeley have a plethora of really great student videos on their websites. And so you can go and you might see a student who identifies similarly, similarly to you 
um, and you could hear about their experience. You might even find a student who just went to the country that you're interested in and you can hear about their experience as well. We also have the links to Brandon and Elizabeth's blog posts. So we hope you'll go and read more about their experiences in depth. Um, great, great information there and student stories are the best. Lastly, we hope this presentation has provided you with a starting point on your journey as to study abroad. We encourage you to explore the UCAP website for detailed information about our program. Um, you should also visit your UC Campus Study Abroad Office website for more information on application steps and deadlines. Once you have determined which program you want to go on, we do have an apply now button on the UCAP website. You can contact the system-wide office for more information. The general email is included on this slide. Um, we also are holding office hours, so if you want to make an appointment to have a one-on-one -on -one with a, an advisor in the system-wide office, um, the QR code for that is on this slide, and I will put it in the chat as well. If you want to grab it from there, um, that opportunity is open to you as well.